Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. Uh, the date today is March 26, 2018, and we have a very uh, <clears throat> important and interesting uh, podcast for you all today on Mormon Stories. Um, we're going to be interviewing Amanda and Matt Ireland. Uh, they are uh, listeners of Mormon Stories Podcast from Australia. Uh, they're going to talk to us about their life as uh, Mormons uh, in Australia, and they're going to talk about a recent faith transition, which they've experienced and kind of where they've come out. Before we actually jump into that story, however, we have a lot of news, and so we want to cover it all. Um, first and foremost, we're really proud to announce that we have uh, made public our sexual harassment policy. So um, but probably a half a year ago, we began, uh, we got some feedback for some listeners, for some former listeners, and we realized that in this Harvey Weinstein Me Too era, it was just really important that we did all we could to make sure we were thoughtful and mindful and compliant about uh, how we handle you know, matters of sexuality and sexual harassment. So we hired a consultant and over the course of several months worked with the consultant to come up with the sexual harassment policy that has been made public. So if you go to openstoriesfoundation.org, you can click on the sexual harassment policy and read about it. This is just one small thing we've done along with our board of directors to make sure that we are responding as we should to um, just this increased awareness and sensitivity towards matters of uh, sexuality, sexual harassment. Um, we've also released our financial report in the Open Stories Foundation for 2017. So if you go to openstoriesfoundation.org, you can find the financial report there. That's um, us living up to our commitment that we've had for years and years to be financially transparent. Um, as a 501c3 nonprofit. You'll find in that report more than the IRS requires us to disclose. Um, and we invite our donors to check that out to get a clear sense of uh, where their donations are going. Even more importantly than that, um, we have some other news. So many of you have been listening, uh, following, we covered last week the Joseph uh, Bishop scandal where Joseph Bishop, the former president of the MTC, um, uh, audio recording was leaked uh, of his, um, and we interviewed Ryan McKnight of Mormon Leaks to discuss that. We have had more news break um, uh, to follow up on that. So the first thing we wanted to make sure you all knew about, last week on Mormon Stories podcast, I believe it was on Friday, we interviewed a man named Christopher Swallow. Christopher Swallow is the second uh, story that we've shared on Mormon Stories podcast now about uh, church cover-ups and sexual harassment. So what Christopher told us in his story, which is not released yet as a proper Mormon Stories podcast episode, Cody's gonna be editing that soon. Um, but what, we, what, what you can do is go to the Mormon Stories podcast page and you can view Christopher Swallow's story. In that story, he tells us um, about a man that he interacted with a family member named Lowell Robison. Lowell Robison was a prominent businessman in the Provo community, and uh, uh, Chris talked about he and his brother and another person close to their friends and family were all um, groomed and sexually abused by this man, uh, Lowell Robison, who later was called as a mission president. And so when Christopher and his brother went to Salt Lake City, uh, spoke directly with Earl C. Tingey, who was a general authority at the time, and reported that this pending uh, mission president had uh, sexually groomed and abused uh, these, these young men. Uh, Earl C. Tingey did nothing about it. And this, this man, Lowell Robison, ended up serving three years um, as a mission president. So it's a second instance that we have where the church has suppressed or covered up sexual abuse um, of its leaders and protected the, abuser, the abusers at the expense of the abused. Christopher also tell, told a heartbreaking story about how he received no support from the church. All Elder Tingey wanted to do was to get the information and silence it. And to this day, um, Chris, uh, um, Chris Swallow has received no support from the church in terms of the abuse that he experienced at the hands of Lowell Robison. Um, and then uh, this morning, Mormon Stories Podcast has now released a third instance of uh, the LDS Church covering up 
uh, sexual abuse and a sexual abuser. We just learned from one of our listeners uh, that a man named uh, Richard Sampson, he was a physician in the Provo Orem area. He served as bishop from 2005 to 2010, and he also served for we don't know how many years as a physician or a doctor in the Provo MTC. We just found out that he was convicted of uh, sexual abuse in 2013, 2014 timeframe. Uh, he is now serving time in prison, I believe. But what we, uh, what we know for sure um, from our tips is that this story was suppressed and covered up. You won't read about this former MTC physician uh, anywhere in the papers, this former Mormon bishop anywhere in the papers. Uh, but we, we do have his mugshot on the mormonstories.org website. If you go to mormonstories.org slash news, you can find this story. It shows his mugshot. It shows his uh, criminal record. And what we're trying to figure out is how much of the abuse happened before he was a bishop, how much of the abuse happened while he was a bishop, how much of the abuse happened while he was a physician with the MTC. And um, what, this, what this represents is a third story that we're finding of cover-up of sexual abuse. And what we want, uh, the reason why we're doing this is not actually to call out abusers. Uh, we, we obviously condemn abuse here on Mormon Stories Podcast, but at the same time, um, our focus isn't really to punish or even uh, malign uh, former abusers. But what we are trying to call attention to, number one, is the very damaging teaching that the LDS Church has that its leadership are called of God. What we're finding are numerous former and current sexual abusers that are being called as bishops or MTC presidents. And um, something that the church needs to do away with immediately is teaching its members that its leaders are called of God. Because when these men are, are called and members believe that they're called of God, that gives them far more power than they should have uh, when they're sexual predators. So we're calling on the church to change that. We're calling on the church to stop this practice of covering up um, and protecting sexual abusers at the expense of the abused. We found out now that with the Joseph Bishop case, the victim uh, that recorded the audio, uh, Joseph Bishop had been uh, reported to the LDS church somewhere between five and seven, seven times by two different victims. And so we know that for many, many years, the LDS Church has known about Joseph Bishop as an abuser. They've done nothing about it. They kept him in callings, uh, uh, even including in the Sunday school. Um, and it's just unacceptable that the church knows about these abuses. They cover them up at the expense of the victims, and it needs to stop. Another thing that needs to stop is the LDS Church doing what it did in January which was to approach the Utah State Legislature and try and get the Utah State Legislature to pass laws making audio recordings um, with bishops and stake presidents a felony to release. We think it's uh, kind of despicable that when the church was handed this audio recording of Joseph Bishop, that it immediately went to the Utah State Legislature and tried to manipulate the sovereign state legislature into making it a felony to share such audio recordings in the future. Uh, the church has to stop that. And then most importantly, the church needs to start believing uh, sexual abuse victims and providing aid and comfort to them instead of only providing a hotline for the bishops to Curtin and McConkie that Curtin and McConkie can then use to protect, further protect the abusers at the expense of the victims, offering very little to no support for the abuse victims themselves. So what we're calling with Mormon Stories we're, we're calling an all-out sort of spotlight investigation where we're encouraging Mormon Stories listeners, their friends, their family to email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. Tell us of any instance you're aware of where uh, someone has been sexually abused and it's been covered up by the Mormon Church. We're going to keep telling these stories over and over and over again until the church fixes the problems that I just outlined. Um, and so if anyone has any information related to um, Dr. Richard Sampson. Uh, what we know again is that he was Bishop of the Provo Peak Seventh Ward from 2005 to 2010. What we know is that he was a doctor at the MTC. Um, and we're trying to find out, was he disciplined? Was he disfellowshipped? Was he excommunicated? 
When did these abuses happen? Before or during or after his time as bishop? Before, or during, or after his time as physician to the MTC? Any information you can give us on um, on Dr. Sampson would be super helpful. One tip that we've already received is that w at least one ward member, his temple recommend was taken away by Dr. Sampson for masturbating while Dr. Sampson was bishop. So here we have a known convicted uh, child molester taking the temple recommend away of one of the members of his ward for masturbating. That's just one little tip that we have. Any other tips you have uh, regarding Dr. Sampson or any other sexual abuse case, we would love for you to share with us. Email us at mormastories at gmail.com. Okay, well, that's a really long um, sort of set of news to introduce a Mormon Stories podcast. Uh, we really want to welcome everyone who's joined us live on Mormon Stories uh, podcast. We, we really love having live um, listeners uh, joining us. And we hope that you enjoy this new setup. We have a new setup. We're in Mormon Story Studio, Studios in Salt Lake City. And we have a three camera setup now um, where we're hoping to give you better uh, cinematic, uh, videographic sort of quality and audio quality with our interviews. So uh, we, we hope that you uh, enjoy the video and audio quality. But most importantly, we're very eager to have those of you who have tuned in with us live um, share comments and and questions um, in your in in the Facebook newsfeed. So please do share anything you have with us. If you have any other feedback, suggestions, whatever, uh, please please do share. So without any further ado, uh, we want to welcome Amanda and Matt Ireland to Mormon Stories podcast. podcast. I, hope I hope you're okay with that very long preamble. Yes, that's fine, John. Thank you very much for having us uh, all the way here from Australia. You too, Amanda. Welcome. Thank you. So um, we, we always like to cover international stories on Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, we also have been covering uh, several couples who have gone through a faith transition. That's something that's really relevant. But we're also just relevant to understand kind of your experiences as Latter-day Saints in Australia. And have you shared anything else you want to share? Sure. So welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you very you. much, John. We're happy to be here. All right. So uh, let's see. How do we begin? I think, Matt, since you you actually were raised LDS, yes. Amanda, we know that you were a uh, convert, and we'll talk about that later. Maybe, Matt, we can start with your kind of LDS background and what you want to share about that sure. as a precursor to um, your story. Sure. Um, I was born in the church. Um, my family was uh, converted by uh, American missionaries, um, which they predominantly all were back in the 50s when, when my parents' um, parents were, were converted and tracked it out in a suburban part of, of Sydney. Um, they joined the church. My father was, was baptised with his brother and, um, and, uh, and the rest is, is sort of history from there, from the, from the 50s. Mum and Dad met. Um, um, but again, they lived in a very suburban part of, of Sydney, which is um, a lot smaller back in those days than what it is today. Um, they uh, were raised in the church and did everything uh, in the church. Um, we obviously um, came along. We lived in a very large uh, ward for for the um, for the area. Mum, I think, was primary president at one stage, and she had, I think, about a hundred children in the primary, which of which there were four of her own children there as well. So it was a. a a very growing area, very bustling sort of family area. Um, being raised in the church myself, um, um, did all the all the standard things: um, primary, uh, young men's, um, going through the church. Um, uh, there's probably nothing unremarkable or anything different to anyone else's upbringing. We, um, our parents, did their best to to raise us and try and have family home evening with three crazy boys and one less crazy girl um, trying to, uh, to listen. Um, but we did all the things, scripture study and, and family prayer and, and, and all those sort of things that, that, that we all do sort of growing up. Um, I think so, yeah, un unremarkable other otherwise, but um, probably a, a little bit different in the sense that um, we're a long way removed from here um, in, in Utah. So everything that was happening in the church was happening somebody, somewhere else 
other than in Sydney. So did you love your upbringing in the church? Absolutely. I, I had a very, very positive time. Um, lots of friends, lots of activities. Things were a bit different back then. And I know some of the people on the podcast here have mentioned, you know, the, the differences sort of in the 70s and 80s growing up, a lot of road shows and even athletics carnivals and all those sort of things that the church put on. It was a very different cultural um, upbringing um, back, back then as it, is, as it is now. A lot of dances and social activities. Um, um, again, sort of throwback from, from, from what, was happening, uh, what was happening here. But a very, very positive experience and, and had a, a really good time. How would you say your your testimony as as a teen was sort of formulated? Did you feel like you had a literal testimony the church's truthfulness, and if so, it yeah it, it, it developed. Um, um, I, I was um, always a bit of a questioning type of person, and so it it didn't come naturally to to me to have the testimony that some people talk about. Um, I guess sort of forwarding through uh, a, a little bit. Um, just before my mission, my uh, bishop um, suggested that I read the Book of Mormon. I had read it before, but that I that I read it and and ask if it's true, as in Moroni's comments in the end, uh, which I did, and I had a very positive experience from that. And so that was probably the the birth of my real testimony um, in, in in the church. And subsequent to that, um, I, I served a mission. And so you probably would say that you you believed the church was true and yes. and uh, knew it was true and yes. testified that it was true and all that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, it was it was something very literal. The Book of Mormon was literally true. The things that that we believe in the church were were literally true, um, and and I was happy to to um, go along with that with that line. Okay, Amanda. So you. Um, you were a convert. Um, how in the world does someone convert to the church? What decade were you a uh, convert to the church? Um, so I joined in the 90s, early 90s. Um, so initially when I was 17, I was finishing up high school and I think it's quite normal for adolescents to start to question, yeah, what, what, what am I here for? What do I want to do? Those really critical life questions are about your identity and... Um, the church ran a television ad campaign um, for what then was the video Our Heavenly Father's Plan. And to my knowledge, it was their first TV um, yeah. uh, series like that. Um, and that ad had those questions about why are you here? You know, is there a purpose in life? And at that time, that really spoke to me. And um, so I called up for the video and, and missionaries, you know, dropped it in and um, started to meet with the missionaries. Um, my family were immediately really concerned. Um, I'd been Catholic but um, wasn't raised active Catholic. Um, but there were times as a Catholic in Mass that I would think, I don't think that God would run a church this way and so I think that helped me search for something else um, I did want to do what God wanted me to do and so seeing that ad just touched me and went this this could be it um, but the negativity from my family around the church they felt that I was um, being taken advantage of by you know young good-looking Americans that are coming to your house and visiting you a few times a week and you know lots of involvement and my mum and especially saw me as a naive young vulnerable person and so it did take it did take me about two years to to join the church I ended up because of the ho the really strong hostility at home about it, I um, moved out of home um, so I could pray and find out if the church was true. I was at, at college full time. I didn't have any money. Um, but I've read in the Bible where it talks about if anyone loves their father or mother more than me, they're not worthy of the kingdom of God. And so I took that literally and moved out of home and left my family and within a week I was baptised. 
Mm. So did that leave you estranged from your parents for getting baptized? Um, it was a very strained relationship for maybe even four years. Mm. For years, it was very difficult. Um, and at one stage, I was advised by a bishop who clearly doesn't or didn't understand the level of conflict that the church had put in between my family um, because the church celebrated that I'd, I'd left my family, that I'd put God first, that that was a noble thing to do. Um, and my family felt very betrayed that I'd chosen a church above them. And so a bishop assured me, you move home, they'll see that this is a good thing for you. Um, and I was really going back into a highly stressful, um, conflicting, difficult relationship, which was not healthy probably for either my, f my family or myself. Um, but yeah, I believed that that would happen if I went home, that their hearts would soften, they would see that I was the same Amanda as I was before, um, and they would be proud that I'd made a good choice. Um, but that, that took many years to, to heal that. Um, but I loved, I loved the church. I didn't, I didn't regret for a second the choice that I'd made. I, um, when I was finally baptised, um, I'd been and meeting with sister missionaries and they were just beautiful. And when I thought, how do I want to be? Um, that was how I wanted to be. They were kind and funny and intelligent and just lovely, lovely girls. And so I could relate and went, that's, that's how I want to be. And therefore the church is a good place. And, um, and so I loved it. And I, I really believed it with all my heart and I felt so grateful to have felt like I'd found the truth. Would you have had any exposure? I'm thinking the early 90s, maybe a lot of the, the kind of spotlight related information relative to the Catholic Church maybe hadn't come out yet. The news reports about the, the sexual abuse by the priests, would that have been anything you were exposed to? No, no, not at all, not at all. Okay. Um, I was aware of other abuses within the Catholic um, Church that had directly affected my family, not of a sexual nature, but of a physical, physical abuse. Um, and so I was aware of that side of it. Um, but Mormonism to me just felt like this breath of fresh air. It was this, it was a, a different time and the culture really around that time was there's a plan of salvation and you're special and God loves you and has a plan for you. And families can be, it was around the time that they released Together Forever. So the idea of um, when you're, you know, 19 years old, of having an eternal family, being able to be married and um, have that marriage continue forever. Um, that's a beautiful idea and concept. And so um, I felt very, very, very blessed and glad that um, the church had come into my life. Excellent. And, and certainly, certainly looking back at that time, John, it, it was a very different time in the church for me as I guess we've all sort of lived in roughly the same time frame that um, it was a very positive message that the church was sharing. As Amanda mm -hmm. saying, it's all about families and um, I remember all the, the videos that we've shown in mission about what, like what is real and all those mm -hmm. ones that I'm sure you've seen. Um, a very positive message of you can find the truth and, and, and the truth is about families and positiveness and um, and that's what they they were pushing, and I thought that was a very, a very positive, very positive message. Un, unlike some of the messages that we've heard today that you've mentioned, and, and other things that are, that are sort of happening in the in, in the church, and the the thrust of where the church wants to go with um, how it wants to be viewed um, is is very different, I think, than how it was in the mm. in the late eighties and the in the early nineties when we were in our sort of formative years in, in the church, it was a very, very positive time to, to be a member of the church. It was, it was exciting and it felt, it really did feel like, and, and we were being told that, that this gospel's sweeping the earth and this is a message for everybody. 
that you have a father in heaven that loves you and that you can have an eternal family and that people would be converting in droves across the world with this beautiful message yeah yeah they i remember i remember those videos like families are forever and our heavenly father's plan mm -hmm. they're so slick they had mm -hmm. michael mclean music yeah. they made you feel what you thought was the holy ghost and they would tell you this message about babies dying and families being forever and it it you know with these clean cut fun charming mm -hmm. missionaries coming by yes i can just see how that could make someone susceptible to a message real quick i have the perception for some reason that australia and new zealand are more secular than let's just say the united states and maybe other areas is that true yes, we were talking about uh, that last night absolutely and was that would that have been true when you guys uh you know kind of grew up perhaps to a lesser extent um but like everywhere um i mean we've we've traveled a fair bit here in the u.s and the amount of churches that are around are far more than what there is in, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, very much more a, a secular society, yes, by a long, long way. Yeah. Have so, it, um, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, having said that, though, um, when I was at, at college, because that's sort of, I was at college when I joined the church, and even though it's secular um, and a lot of people don't believe, everyone was very supportive of, me joining the church you know there was this um just because other people aren't religious i still felt extremely supported in my right to to choose to be religious and to to live that way so there's a lot of acceptance for whether you yeah want to attend church or or don't um it's not at that stage, definitely not looked down I think, upon. I think that's probably more our it's, culture. She'll be right, mate. Whatever you want to it's do. It's probably you, changed you do. a bit more now. Yeah. But yes. But at that time, yeah. Very secular. Um, yeah, it, it makes you wonder what, how, kind of with the internet and with the modern age, how anyone could end up sort of potentially joining. But we'll talk. We'll talk more about that later. So Matt, let's go back to you. Yeah. Anything you want to talk about your mission that's of note? Uh, I served in, in Brisbane Mission, um, uh, uh, 91 to 93. Um, I still have contact with some of my mission companions. Um, it was a wonderful time. Um, I was district leader for most of it and zone leader for a little while. Um, uh, so, I, look, it was, a, it was a very positive experience. I liked my mission. I liked um, um, sharing the gospel. It was very, it was very positive. Um, you know, like any mission, people do things wrong. Um, I mean, there's plenty of stories there, but you know, probably no different to any other, any other mission. Um, but a very positive experience, and I think in in a, a lot of ways, it prepared me a, a lot for for life. It, serving a mission is all about talking to people about something that ultimately, at least for most of it, they don't want to talk about, um, and and that's that's. That's a good skill to have, I think, um, in, in most jobs and, and those sort of things. So I look back positively at that experience and I, and I appreciate the skills that it gave me um, um, uh, as I move forward. Having said that, um, the only caveat on that is that obviously with um, having, having um, left the church and not going anymore, um, there's a sense of... of um, I was going to say guilt, but maybe that's not the right word. I, I didn't know anything different at the time, but um, a sense of something as, as I look back. And I've tried to contact a couple of the people that we baptised and, and um, to my knowledge, actually all of them have left the church. Um, but I've contacted a few of them and, um, and, and had a chat about their stories and I've chatted about mine. We can talk about that at the end. Um, no worries. So, but you had a great mission. I loved it. Enjoyed it. Fantastic. And, and Amanda, when you, you chose to serve a mission too, is that mm -hmm. right? And that would have been back in the 90s, maybe when it wasn't common, as common for women to serve missions. What, what made you decide to be a missionary and how was that experience for you? Um, I think probably because I joined the church when I was, I was 19 and so I finished college when I was 21 and so it was kind of perfect timing. And, and I really loved the message of, of hope that that the church presented and so because of 
the joy that I felt that it had brought to my life. I really wanted to share that with other people. Um, so I was called to the um, Provo, Utah mission um, and, and was very excited. Um, if there was conflict with my family prior um, or around me joining the church, it amped up significantly in preparation for my mission. Um, if my parents had the view that I'd joined a cult, um, having their young daughter now taken off to Utah and they had fears of, you know, me being forced into some polygamous marriage and they'd never see me again. So they were extraordinarily worried about me serving a mission in Utah. Um, it probably would have been an easier pill to swallow had it been somewhere else, but um, the Mormons dragging their daughter off to Utah was, um, was yeah, not, not, not seen as a comfortable thing. Um, the, I think that really impacted my experience in the MTC. Mm -hmm. So, um, overall, um, how would you rate your experience as a missionary? It was extremely difficult. Um, from, from the beginning when at the MTC, when our, our bishop or, or branch president over the districts that you have when you're in the MTC, um, my story of, you know, leaving home to join the church and, and um, this sense that I'd sacrificed so much to join the church was held very highly. Um, and, and so on one hand, there was sort of a, a sense of almost status. And I'd, before my mission, I, I read the standard works. I'd done everything I could to prepare for my mission. And so I was kind of held up like, you know, this is someone that we should try and be like that sacrificed so much for the church. The difficult for me was, was on one of the evenings um, there was a, a fireside or a meeting where a leader talked about unresolved sin and that um, if anyone had unresolved sin that they needed to, to go talk to their, um, I think it's called a branch president in the MTC, I'm not sure what it's called, but the equivalent of your bishop in, your M in the MTC. And so I was very racked with guilt. There was, um, I guess, two incidents of what I would consider minor violations of the law of chastity. Um, but I just felt so guilt-ridden around it. Um, in order to meet with that bishop, I had to go through my district president, who was in my class, who is, you know, some 19-year-old <laughs> kid, and you're having to ask permission for him to contact the bishop for you to meet with the bishop so he knows that they, you have an unresolved sin and then you're having to confess that to the bishop which was just absolutely mortifying um, and so I felt from that I went from you know being sort of an example or a um, you know that I'd, I'd done so, I'd given up so much for the church and all of a sudden that was destroyed because I was having to confess over said, what I considered minor chastity violations and that um, was just humiliating and, and how it, it made me feel, you know, made me feel and from then on I felt judged differently. Um, I felt that instead of that praise and respect that I was marked, you know. Mm. Um, and I was uh, also worried that the bishop would then contact my mission president, say we've got this sister that who has confessed to this, you're going to have to keep an eye on her or, or whatever. And so that guilt um, and shame... Um, that I hadn't felt prior to the MTC was really difficult. And to know that I was so isolated, separate to being isolated in a different location, another country from my family, um, the way I had left and how estranged our relationship was um, put me in a really vulnerable position to feel really isolated. And 
to not really have anybody to talk through any of that or to support me through that. Um, and so that was really difficult for me. Did that follow with you throughout your entire mission, That the fog of that experience? I did. As a result of that and, and only I was able to stay on my mission for four months. I didn't realise it at the time, but... Um, I was experiencing classic anxiety and depression symptoms. Um, when we would teach, um, my companion would have me retell my conversion story. And so over and over again, um, a conversion story should be positive. Um, but my, my conversion story was traumatic because of what it had done to my family and how painful that was and so you're being asked over and over and over again to retell I mean I was glad I joined the church but it was still a highly traumatic experience and to have to keep reliving that over and over again was was horrible um I started to not be able to get out of bed to have no energy to feel overwhelmed um, to not feel like I wanted to, to go out of the, the apartment and meet with people. I was sort of forcing, just sort of white-knuckling through it. Um, I met with my mission president after a zone conference and said, I'm really struggling here. I, I feel extremely unwell. I um, said, can't, can't get out of bed. Um, and his solution was to send me, so a missionary couple took me to Salt Lake to meet with um, an elder Stanley in this, I think he was in the first quorum of 70. Um, and so to talk to him about what was happening and whether I should go home. Um, I shared with him the exact same symptoms and it is probably typical of the time but due to no mental health knowledge, neither my mission president or the, or the general authority I met with um, recognised that my symptoms were classic anxiety and depression. And had I have been able to receive treatment on my mission, I'm confident I would have remained on my mission. But that remained undiagnosed and... I went home after four months and I was a mess. R real quick, um, sometimes when when a, a convert becomes someone estranged from their, their family for converting, they're actually celebrated and they're encouraged to tell that story yeah. because it sounds so good. It's almost like you were so courageous, you were so noble that you were willing to join the church even in the face of adversity. Did your story get received that way? Uh, and absolutely. did that did that complicate it all? Absolutely. Your telling of it? Yeah, absolutely it did. Unfortunately there's this there's this I, I can't think of a different word, but a status to it. Um, and you know, you want to do the right thing. You want to um, yeah, I, it really fed into fed into that and, and I felt such guilt that on one hand I was so grateful for the gospel I wanted to force myself to stay and um, work with people and share this message um, but I was just so unwell um, and didn't know what was wrong um, and so that was, that, was, that was very difficult so it was sort of years before I actually found out what was wrong? Mm. I'm so sorry. So, yeah, you know, I wish it could have been diagnosed by it. And I hope that mission presidents now um, and, and just general church leaders are more aware of basic symptoms of things like anxiety and depression, which is so common and so common with missionaries based on the environment of a, the mission it lends itself to missionaries feeling isolated from their families and they're young and they're vulnerable and they work long hours and um, and so it's sort of a um, 
bit of a perfect storm if you have that sort of predisposition or um, it puts you at such a greater risk for those mental health issues to come up on your mission. I know that in my mission, in so many missions, um, kind of the, the wife of the mission president is viewed as sort of the mother of all the missionaries. And if that mission, mission president's wife happens to have weird or unscientific or goofy or unhealthy views on physical and mental health, sometimes uh, missionaries physical and mental health needs can be either completely neglected or improper recommendations can be made. Uh, and and we, don't, we don't know how much training mission presidents and their wives receive related to physical and mental health. And so uh, we could do a whole Mormon story series on physical and, and mental neglect of Mormon mission missionaries. If I'd have even been sent to a gen general practitioner, doctor, I, I'm not sure what you call them here, but... It, at home, we call it just a, a general doctor. Um, any doctor would have seen, <laughs> yeah. heard the symptoms and said, yeah, we need to. <laughs> um, and maybe even just knowing that that's what was happening right. would have assisted me in going, okay. Right. Know. I think there was some... You know what you're dealing with. I think there was some document, John, did you release? Um, or was it WikiLeaks? Um, about mission presidents training a whole PowerPoint series of PowerPoint slides and I have an interest in mental health and um, I think some of the slides were to do with were to do with mental health but from memory they weren't they were there but they weren't great and they're only recent ones so I, I think unfortunately um, mission presidents if they don't have any prior training in mental health probably don't have very much more now than what they did back then right so, um, so you both come off your missions. Uh, who wants to tell the story yeah. of how you met and got married? Maybe I'll tell it. Um, so um, I didn't know Amanda before I left for my mission. Um, you had heard of me. Mm. Um, so my dad was the, the ward mission leader at the time. And um, sort of towards the end of my mission, he had a, uh, a very sprightly young lass as a as a um, as a ward missionary. That was Amanda, and um, and so in the letters that that um, that we would exchange between my family and I, um, I was told about Amanda from my parents. Oh, this lovely young lady, maybe you might want to meet when you come back. Um, interestingly, my patriarchal blessing says that my wife will be for my choosing, and I sort of feel that maybe my parents chose her for me, but. Um, um, maybe we'll claim each other now. But um, uh, so um, I came home from, from my mission. Amanda came home from hers. Um, um, we dated other people and, and whatever else. But after a fairly short period of time, um, we, we met. I remember meeting at, at mum and dad's house. I think you were there for a, a mission meeting or something with dad. And, um, and I'd heard all these things about, um, about Amanda. And I think she'd heard some things about me. And... We finally met, and um, and I don't know if it was love at first sight, but it was pretty close. Um, I I saw her and was just amazed at how beautiful she was and how much she glowed, and um, and I remember that very very much uh, about our first meeting. Um, how long after that? Maybe you can help me with the dates. Um, so we were friends for a little bit, but once we yeah. once we started dating, we were engaged after two weeks and married nine weeks after that. <laughs> what? Nine weeks? Engaged I'm, after two weeks, married yep. after nine weeks? Yep. That's not just Provo. That's <laughs> no, that's Provo Plus. <laughs> um, I, I think I think we both look. I guess ultimately people do that and, and marriages don't last. Um, we've, we're just celebrating uh, next month our 24th ah, wedding congrats. anniversary. Um, uh, so at least at this stage it's lasted and we, we plan on making it last a, a whole lot longer now. Um, but look, we, we, felt, we felt right um, about each other and we felt that that was the right thing to do and, and, and we did it and doesn't mean we haven't had hard times, obviously, along the way. We certainly have, and our, the first part of our marriage was very, very difficult. Um, 
particularly with some parts of Amanda's family and, 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 and others, and just that transition to, uh, to being married in that sort of environment, that was really, really tough. Um, I think um, when we got married, uh, the rule in Australia, like a lot of, a lot of countries, is that um, if you choose to not get married or sealed in the temple first up, you have to wait a year. So if you just have a legal marriage, then you have to wait the year to be sealed. And we, we didn't want that. Uh, I knew that, you know, Matt had been raised in the church to temple marriage first. Um, and so we made that decision. But, of course, what that decision meant was that my family were not going to see me get married. Mm. Um, I tried to, I'd read, um, you know, Boyd K. Packer's, the, I think it's the Holy Temple. It talks about how to include people that can't go into the temple. I tried to do that with my family and involve them in the wedding reception afterwards and things like that. But my Didn't family, really yeah, my family were just too hurt. They couldn't understand why if we could get married civilly first and they could see it and then us to be sealed 12 months later, why would we deliberately or why would I deliberately choose a wedding that would exclude them? Um, and so as a result, it was just too distressing. So um, none, of my ch my, none of my family at all um, participated in any way on our wedding day. And um, and I was glad that, that I married Matt, but it was really the saddest day of my life. It mm. just broke my heart. I, I hoped that my family would eventually would say, look, we disagree, but we love you enough um, to, to be there in whatever capacity we can. But they weren't able to do that. And so it was very, very sad for me to be in a ceiling room with a room full of, um, uh, you know, some of the people I barely knew. Quite. Because um, they were all sort of Matt's family. And other than Matt, there was not one person of significance there for me. And that was really sad. And the the resulting sort of impact of that extreme sort of hostility and stress resulted in a really, which is when I finally got diagnosed with, with depression, a really significant depressive episode which basically lasted two <coughs> years and resulted in me barely, barely being able to get out of bed. And so we went from 11 weeks of hardly knowing each other to... Matt being married to a woman who could barely get out of bed. Um, we still attended church and the best we could and um, and so but it, it, it was hard. yeah, it was really, really difficult. And Matt had I mean, I was used to an emotionally turbulent family. Matt wasn't. And so he had no idea how to manage a wife who's so unwell I um, even ended up the the stress resulted in me getting severe dermatitis which was so severe I was hospitalized for 10 days um, and it was it was really difficult um, quite interestingly um, around that time Matt decided to study psychology <laughs> and started his undergraduate in psychology after um so some good came out of that um but yes yeah, but it was really it was really hard to see me to go through that and and as you know john with anything to do with mental health there's there's not a whole lot you can do other than just be there at, from a spouse point of view and we got counseling for amanda and, and medication whatever we needed um but from my point of view it was it was really hard to see the woman i loved go through something so difficult as a result of actually trying to do the right thing and that was that was that took a while to for us I think both to to work through and um, that was probably the hardest time of our marriage yeah it was yeah. and and really it was grieving for all of the conflict that had occurred 
since investigating the church. Like the temple marriage was the final, um, the final straw in what was years of, of extreme stress in trying to negotiate the church and family. So some people's depression can be just very biological. It can be inherited. It can be just sort of what they bring chemically and neurologically to their lives. Mm -hmm. And then other times depression can very much be situational. And it's probably impossible for any of us to know to what extent either are really playing in. But is it your impression that your, your depression and anxiety really was tied to these experiences you were having with the church? It's very, it's definitely very tied to, um, to traumatic or really difficult events. Um, uh, I, medication never worked for me, so there was never sort of a physiological brain, you know, chemical imbalance that medication would help. Um, and it really was probably depression, but two years of grieving. Um, and, and getting through that, that extreme pain. And, and also feeling, um, you know, the bishop, I'm sure, had good intentions. But his advice for me to return home into such a tumultuous, con highly emotional and conflicting um, environment was extremely detrimental to my mental health. Mm, I'm so sorry. Really detrimental. And I, and I think I think that goes towards, you know, the discussion about, you know, ho however, as Amanda said, well-intentioned bishops are, maybe stick to the to the spiritual side of things and let others negotiate the complexities of mental health and all the other things that that are in life that they're not trained sexual assault, all those other things that that, that uh, have experts in the field ready and willing to help people in, in that. You needed that. And as I said, I, I think that, that idea was represented a fairly big downhill I think, start. I think the, you know, the, the intentions, like it was, he's, he's a, a good man, the man that we had at Bishop as the time. But I think when we come back to absolutely believing that this man is called of God and what they're giving you is revelation from God, then if you, you believe it, it, how, why would you do anything differently? So that wasn't an intellectual decision for me. I complied with that out of faith. I'd been given a direction by a bishop. I believe he was called of God. This was revelation. This was the right thing to do and it would have the outcome that he told me it would. So tough, uh, tough early years with the church, Amanda. But my guess is you still, you internalized it as your, your experiencing adversity for the truth. Is, is that right? Absolutely. So did that make it better? Did that carry you? Um, yes. Yeah. I, I felt, I felt very, I think at that time too, there was a, a culture around um, this idea that we really control our own thoughts and that if I just had worked harder, done more, been more, somehow more diligent in some way, um, I wouldn't have experienced that. So there was still this feeling of I wasn't good enough and that's why I couldn't conquer it. Mm. Um, your prayers, yes, you're praying, but they're not good enough. They're not diligent enough. They're not grateful enough. Maybe you're not reading the scriptures with enough intent. So it's quite easy, and I think depression can mean that you turn the guilt back onto you. So it's not the church's fault that you're not coping, it's your fault. Yeah, it makes it worse. Not good for somebody with depression. No. So you guys, uh, you've been married 24, almost 24 years, so that's a long time in the church. Yeah. So I'm assuming that intermixed with the depression and anxiety, there would have been a lot of years of having kids and serving in church callings. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, we uh, we're it was both wonderful. Yeah, we we had a wonderful. We don't want to downplay. I'm happy to call good good, and and we had a wonderful wonderful time um, 
raising our children in the church and serving in the church. Um, um, I've served in most most callings as, as Amanda. Um, we had we had a great time. We've moved around a little bit with um, with work. Um, I was a branch president for about five years um, down the south coast of New South Wales, a lovely um, coastal little uh, fishing village there. Um, um, interesting story about about getting called um, our district president, who's a lovely, lovely man, um, and his wife and family came down to the hospital where we had just given birth to oh, number yeah. number three, and I think third in three years. She and was, she was a a day old, I think. We we're still there at the hospital. And um, we're exchanging gifts and, and as it turns out, he says, oh, Matt, can I, um, can I have a chat with you for a second just in the, the next room? I said, sure, sure, no worries. So we, we I, I thought how generous they were to have travelled over an hour to come and... Visit us. Visit us in <laughs> hospital after giving birth to our baby. Little did we know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he asked how I was going and at the time we were... Uh, living about two and a half or three hours from my work. So I would travel up for a block of days at work and then come back for a block of days at home. So that was pretty hard on our, on our family. Uh, he then uh, proceeded to uh, to call me or to extend the call to me as, as the branch president. Um, uh, I was surprised that he would, given my home situation and how little time I was there and not all together there for Sundays either. Some Sundays I would be working, I'm a shift worker, so um, it, it made it um, a bit difficult and I was a bit surprised that he would extend that, that call. Um, but I, he knew that and I explained to him that as long as he was happy to call me on that proviso, that I was happy to serve. Uh, and, um, and so with, a, with two other little kids and a one day old, and a recovering wife um, in, in, in hospital, um, I accepted the, the call to, to serve in that, in that capacity. Um, it, was a, it was a little branch. It was a lovely little branch full of wonderful, wonderful families. Um, but it was small and we were meeting at that time and, and perhaps this will show a bit of our, our experience from, from our country uh, and perhaps those others around the world that, that have sort of fledgling um, units in the church, very much unlike here in, in, in Utah where you've got, I think we were driving and we passed about 25 chapels on the way here in a half an hour drive and, and Amanda was suggesting that, you know, perhaps three or four different wards might need at each one and so very, very different layout. Um, so our branch had about 20, 25 people in it, um, uh, a number of inactive people throughout the, the area and we were meeting in the high school, and so we'd have to get there and sort of clean it up and set up the room and the graffiti and chewing gum all over the chairs, and it wasn't it wasn't ideal. And so, after being um, uh, sustained in that calling, I felt very strongly impressed to get us a new place to to be. Um, I can be fairly persuasive at times, and um, I knew some people in the church facilities department uh, in Sydney and, um, and we got someone to come down and have a look and we ended up renting uh, an office space and having them spend some money to convert it to a, to a functional little chapel and in a, such a small location with such a small amount of people um, we were able to to get a little bit more than what we deserve down there and um, and so we had this wonderful wonderful building uh, brand, all brand new inside and new paint and everything and carpet it was lovely and so over the course of that that five years of, of service there we doubled nearly tripled the size of the um, active uh, attendance of a, of a Sunday um, we had new people move in we had um, reactivated uh, a lot of the old people that were that were on the books but not coming and we had a very, very vibrant community down there. And we were known in the community as being um, a church that you could go along to and, and enjoy. And the families were positive and, and good. Um, and, um, and it was a good time. And it was a fantastic little part of, of our lives down there and, and a fantastic service. Um, and so, yeah, all the things that you do as a branch president, 
we did and Amanda probably was um, my real first counsellor I think and mm. when you're in a, such a small branch like that you rely very heavily on uh, on, on, on each other and, and we did and we had firesides and youth activities and all sorts of things down there. And we went from the community not having a very positive view of the church at all to really turning that around and I know you know, considering mm. at, at one stage, you know, we might have had 30 active, me- active members. We had a Christmas party that had 85 non-members attend and have a fantastic time. And so it, right. it was... Right. Um, there was more non-members there than there were members. Yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. Um, and our kids enjoyed and enjoyed that. And, mm. um, and I think you realise too, when you're in a very small branch like that again unlike I guess a lot of the experience here you do multiple callings you do sort of a little bit of everything um, it's it's a very different type of service and, and in Sydney we're in, currently in a, in, a, in a large ward now um, it's very very different and and again those that are around the world listening to this in countries that have very small branches will perhaps know what I mean in in relation to that it's um, it is a wonderful and very very insular, but very, very tight, and and you grow to love people very differently. I think in a in a in a very, very tight sort of way where you, you get on with people because you're doing everything together, and um and it's a real sense of community, and we really enjoyed that part of our lives. And that's something that can be uh well, it can be wonderful, and it can be a little bit disorienting when you have a faith crisis because that just because you have a faith crisis doesn't mean you didn't have some incredibly mm. wonderful years and I'm getting right. a sense from you both that your time serving in the church in that branch were like Camelot years to use a, a US metaphor yes, yes, I understand. were uh, were wonderful right they, they, they were and, and we look back um, and we talk about those times very fondly together uh, uh, both serving in the church but also um, how we grew together during that time and and so that was good for us um, personally, but also um, um, it was good in our in our in our church, in our church service. And again, I I think we both choose to to look back on those times, um, even though we've both gone through um, a faith cross or transition, whatever we call it these days. Um, not with cynicism or anything like that. I I I think we both grew together. We both grew individually. We had some wonderful experiences. We got to meet some wonderful people, and, and I'll take that, and I'll take that right. I think, for my life. I think that because although we were, you know, extremely active and enthusiastic and believing, um, Matt was always a slightly think out of the box kind of person, and that's her nice way of saying I'm a bit weird. And no, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so like, one of the programs that that you know, he started down there was what became yeah. KFC home teaching where um, once a month... KFC is? Yes, they Kentucky have KFC Fried here. Chicken. Yeah. yeah, Kentucky Fried yeah. Chicken. Yeah. So all of the young men and the members of the priesthood would meet and they would go out and everyone would do their home teaching that night and then they would turn it into an activity where they went back and had Kentucky Fried Chicken together and... The young men loved it. Everybody loved mm. it. It was said thinking outside the box, not running home the home teaching program how it was normally traditionally run, um, right. but it worked. So he had the Matt had the freedom to not always stick to the rules, but get the the spirit of the job done. And because um, no one was doing their home teaching, it was no, zero, zero, percent. zero. Yeah, and that's not just a U.S. thing. Yeah, no, 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 that's not. No. We, we realised that. Um, and then, of course, I did the typical thing of um, because it was so small. I had fourteen um, sisters to visit on my visiting teaching list, and of course, was doing my visiting teaching, dropping off my message when I went into early labour. We're driving to the hospital, and we're <laughs> dropping into all of my sisters to drop in, um, you know, cards and 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 cookies and stuff. So um, we were we were we were all in, and we loved it. Absolutely loved it. 